The hose stiffened slightly. The pump operator must have increased the water pressure. Then it slackened to its previous strength. Tricky, though the fire... Tricky, thought the fireman. He'll throw me off the wall if he does this too much. His thoughts returned to the limousine, but, distracted from their original plane, they began to consider the rich man more detachedly. Of course, thought the fireman, you can't blame them for wanting to keep away from the bustle. They've got to keep their minds clear in that sort of job. The more leisure for consideration, the greater their efficiency. Yet perhaps if they took their part in the scramble for the tube and in the bus queue in the rain, well, they'd get to know their fellow man better. What they think is sacrifice and efficiency might be com compensated by a greater knowledge of people, a love for the masses their industries serve, in fact, an efficiency of living. But perhaps the rich man would never grow to love his people. Perhaps they would just irritate him so that he might direct his industry finally against them. No, better the limousine in the distance. Let him see them from a distance and love them if he is man enough. Or, again, does the distance most usually engender nothing more than a barrier of unfamiliarity? We mistrust the unfamiliar. We fear it. And that is haste. Or, and that is hate. Hate. The fireman looked down at the pump operator and remembered the row they had had that afternoon. He thought, I wonder if he hates me. He watched a dim figure stooping over the pump controls, peering at the gauges in the yellow light of his torch. A curious fellow keeps himself to himself, hardly says a word, yet he opted out, yet he opened out well. And truly, this afternoon, could I help it if the girl happened to be his sister? Yes, a quiet chap, but in a way quite naturally, or but in a way not naturally quiet, more as though he were always compressing some terrific energy that boiled to get out of him. I don't like the way his brows devil together. That's said to be a dangerous sign. Suddenly the fireman was thinking of a barber's chair. He had a fad about barber's chairs. He would never let a barber shave him, for instance. He imagined that perhaps with the soft temptation of his naked neck, with the keen razor poised in his barber's hand, with some deep weariness of life ticking away in the barber's head, that the barber's mind might snap, and he would flick the razor deep into the tender throat already clutched so firmly in his hand. The fireman shivered. Then, even on the hard brick, his spine stiffened, and he sat bolt upright. Perhaps that would happen with the pump man. Perhaps... There were years of suppressed feeling growing within his head like the poison of a tumor. A tumor that was being forced to a point that very moment by a sharp hatred of the man who had inv invaded his sister so that this was the moment, the blinding moment of noise and fierce light when the tumor would rip itself open. The fireman knew well that the pump operator could murder him with a little dive of his forefinger he could press down the throttle so that a powerful gust of water would whip through the hose, lifting him clean off the wall, throwing him high in the air, above the burning mess below. He shuddered and glanced down in dread at the man beneath him. Then he checked the, wil the wildness of his thinking with a short laugh. Such things didn't happen, not really, but although he was laughing at himself, he scarcely moved his head to look down. Beneath his laughter, he was afraid of what he might see. Suddenly, the night flared up. A brilliant red glare flooded through the mist and smoke. Everything flashed into being. Light evaporated the mist, so that each corner of architecture, each detail of the pump, each line of the operator's uniform leapt into abrupt definition, like objects switched suddenly onto a screen. We learnt afterwards that an oil tank had been ignited somewhere across the road. The fireman was looking straight at the pump operator, the operator turned his face upward as the light came. Every feature could be distinguished, and they stared into each other's faces. A lump of fear choked the fireman's throat, for the operator was smiling. Beneath the dark V of his brows, the eyes glittered with furious amusement. The lips drew back on teeth half-opened in a yellow snarl of delight. Have you ever seen a dog laugh? It was like that, humorous yet malevolent, a puppet of a laugh the mounting of a lunatic child over fangs that were made to bite. In that malicious instant of blinding light, the fireman saw three things. This terrible smile 
beneath it the man's hand covering his murderous throttle lever, and beyond and all around the scalding mass of beans, he thought suddenly of the parade ground, where once he had seen three heavy men holding the nozzle end of a charged line of hose. Someone, back at the pump, had accelerated the water pressure. Very slowly the men had been lifted from their feet as the hose stiffened and recoiled. The men had hung there, stupidly in the air, three heavy men powerless to weigh down the slim water hose, or the slim white hose. Before every great catastrophe, there is said to be a pause, a terrible imagined silence, a terrible imagined silence. Threatened men, for the first time in their lives, become aware of certainty. The quicksilver sets, time freezes solid. Always before, at every crisis, there has somewhere appeared an alternative of escape. But now, even as their minds wildly search for a way out, they are sure in their souls that at last there is none. The hypothesis is ab or the hypnosis is absolute. Each muscle freezes, not so much with dread as with knowledge, and then, in the least part of the last second, the will to movement reserts itself. In any direction, they will run, strike, jump. It is the final act of survival. Hearing the bomb whistle down from above, the audience in a theater, with no room to throw themselves to the ground, rise to their feet as though an anthem were being played. A sailor jumps from his boat before it strikes the rock. Just as, before the pressure reached him, the, fireman's, the fireman threw himself from the wall. He flung the hose away from him and, swinging his leg over, just as if he were dismounting from a horse, he left the wall and dived down into the boiling beans. That was what happened. But to this day, we cannot be sure that the pressure ever really increased. We never saw the pump operator's hand move the throttle. Perhaps the fireman never really saw the smile. Perhaps the smile never existed. It is possible, after all, that it was nothing more than an expression of fear at the sudden bright glare. That is possible. A moment's fear transformed into a smile of hatred, only by the fireman's brain, the unreliable agent that informed us, the witnesses, his eyes. And that's the end.